Welcome, everybody. So we'd like to welcome today a speaker from Penn State University, Dr. Ali Carr Chelman. She'll be speaking about boys, schools, and games, and how culture intersects in these three spaces. This is part of our Digital Humanities Bregman seminar series. Uh, we've had other speakers on campus. Last year, we had Amanda Brennan on campus. Um, she was actually pretty cool, and we had uh, a nice speech that she gave, and it was like a history of memes, and that's available online at the library. I encourage you to go see that if you didn't catch it. Uh, for those of you watching online, uh, we wish you were here in person, but we hope you enjoy this. And I'm sure if you had any follow-up questions, um, Dr. Carchel would be happy to answer those questions if you had any uh, questions that you won't be able to ask today. So we're very happy to have them here. They are here not only to give this speech, but they're also looking to form uh, sort of a partnership with Penn State SUNY Potsdam, which is very exciting. Um, this means that they will articulate students, if we get it all right, from their, from our graduate programs into their PhD programs. So if anybody is, yes, we do have master's degree programs on campus, for those of you who didn't know we do, and we do, and they're looking to partner with us in that regard. So we actually have a representative here in the front row, if you want to raise your hand. Nate Turcott um, just left our master's degree program in educational technology and is in their learning design and technology PhD program in his first year. So if anybody wants to talk to an ambassador from Potsdam to PSU, um, we've got Nate here to speak to anybody after. We have about a 40 minute presentation followed by Q&A afterwards. We hope to get you out in time for your one o'clock class. Um, and certainly Ali will hang around a little bit more for those of you who have a little more time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Cartel. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, wonderful weather here in City of Potsdam. I assume it's always like this. It's just gorgeous. And we missed the snow last week, I hear. So um, we, we're very happy to be here. Grateful for the invitation. And have had a lovely time uh, on your campus already. So I just want to uh, share with you a, a few pictures, some photographs taken by a 13-year-old boy at our, at our research site, which is in Lake Wallen Pompac, Pennsylvania. This is not a secret place. Uh, most, most studies you see will say, a large Midwestern university, or a small rural Pennsylvania school, or something like that. But we have permission to actually use the name of the school where, where these photographs and where a lot of our research has come from. Um, and these are some photographs that have been taken by him as he better understood the people that we were studying and what they were about. Um, then I asked him to write narrative that went with these pictures, and this is the narrative that he wrote to go with these photographs. This boy is focusing intently on Madden, building skills of grit and perseverance. I think he's heard a little bit of our language already. Um, this one is. Weights are like games. The more you lift them, the more weight you can add on, and the better you will get. Picking teams is a crucial part of playing any video game. It can affect out an outcome in every way. <coughs> Building trust and increasing social activity is a crucial part of gaming for boys. Boys not only interact within video games, they also value physical play and competition. Which is some of these pictures here, I hope. There we go. Young men want to feel in control. School alienates them. They don't like school, they don't feel connected to it. But gaming lets them be in a world where adults trust them and they're in control. I'm gonna go back to one here. Boys wake up and they wanna play games. Boys go to school and they'd rather play games. At 3.30 when school is done, their real education begins when they start to play games. So I thought that that was a really interesting um, set of pictures and an interesting set of reflections from a young man who plays games, enjoys playing games, and um, kind of gives you a glimpse into what he understands as the value of gaming for his own education. Now I'm going to switch computers here. Hopefully this will not be a big deal. I should get the next screen coming up. You should get it. Okay. Bring Back the Boys project is 
about gaining and re-engaging boys in learning. In order to best explain why we're interested specifically in boys, girls also benefit largely from games and from engaged learning, but we're particularly interested in boys for a number of specific reasons. And I'm gonna start by giving you a few bits of background information about why we're interested in boys. So first, what do you think boys are like? Well, this is what we wish they were like. Here they are, reading quietly, and uh, everybody's all dressed up, and our good scouts playing the bugle and dancing at a wedding, right? But this is what they're really like. That's what they're really like, right? This, these are boys now, right? They're playing on video games, they love guns, they love superheroes. Um, this is what boys are really like. Now, what the reality is, is that what boys are really like doesn't match all that well with what schools are really like. And what we're seeing is some pretty dramatic statistics around this that I'm going to share with you to make a compelling case that we really need to re-engage all kids, but particularly we need to pay attention to figuring out how to re-engage boys in their education. All right. So, if you're a boy, you're three times as likely to be expelled, suspended in special education, labeled as learning disabled, or labeled as emotionally disturbed. Three times as likely. You're four times as likely to be identified with ADHD. For those of you who are familiar with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD um, is more likely to be diagnosed in boys than in girls because boys manifest it loudly and girls manifest it quietly. That just means that there's an underdiagnosis among girls. But it also means that the kinds of disturbances that we're getting from boys are identified, targeted, and the teachers are often pulling those kids out. You may not know it, but it is pretty amazing that 75 to 80 percent of the world's medications for ADHD, not just in the U.S., 75 to 80 percent of the world's medications in ADHD are going into American boys. So we have to ask the question, are we medicating them because they are boys or because of the way that they do? The PISA test results are pretty compelling in this, in this regard as well. PISA is an organization that tests worldwide math, science, reading, literacy. Um, language skills of various sorts. And uh, up until the last administration, the most recent administration, the test scores had always been universally, boys did better on math and science, girls did better in reading and language. And that had always been the way it was. And there were some people who said, well, you know, here's the reason why, here's the reason why. There are lots of postulations about why that's happening. But ultimately, in the last testing, among schools that actually send girls, I'm, I'm sorry, among countries that actually send girls to school, so there are some countries that don't send girls to school, and in those countries, girls are obviously lagging way behind boys. But in the countries where boys and girls both go to school, the PISA results showed that boys did more poorly in reading and language arts, as they always had, but also in math and science for the first time. So universally, boys lost ground globally in terms of their skills in math and science, most recently. Within higher education, it might be interesting to see this particular chart. For every hundred women who earn a bachelor's degree, 73 men earn one. Women outnumber men obtaining master's degrees by more than 30%. Most campuses are moving, small campuses are moving to about 60% female population on campus. Um, the small liberal arts colleges are more like 70 to 30, 70% female. That makes university presidents very nervous because girls don't want to go to school where there aren't any boys to date. So we have, we have an issue there we really got to pay attention to. This middle point here is 1983, just so you know. Right when we hit 50% was 1983. So it has been quite some time that women have been earning more degrees than men. All right, why is this happening? I'm going to go through these very quickly. Some of you may have seen the TED Talk that I gave. Um, a couple years ago, and it goes over these in more detail. If you're interested in that, you can find it online. Just look up my name and TED Talk and it'll come up. Um, briefly though, zero tolerance policies. Most schools have a policy that basically says um, no guns, no um, bombs, no bomb threats, no all of these kinds of things, which is a very reasonable thing, excepting that sometimes it gets applied in very unreasonable ways. And so what we see is sometimes um, a child who wants to write about a violent video game is told that he's going to be expelled or that he's going to need to go and see a psychologist because this is a real problem. Um, so zero tolerance policies, the way that they have been implemented is the primary issue there. The compressed curriculum, what we're learning in kindergarten now, um, is approximately what, what we would have learned maybe 20 years ago in first and second grade. So now by the end of kindergarten, 
you have to be able to read full sentences in a book, maybe with pictures, maybe without. This is a very different space than we were 20 years ago in terms of our curriculum. And this compression is not good for any kid, especially not any active learner who needs to get up and move around. Because more and more, starting in kindergarten, you sit in your seat and you do what you're told and you color within the lines. And it's less and less possible to get up and move around, have a kinesthetic learner, have an active learner, be it boy or girl. And there are fewer and fewer men in elementary school classrooms in particular. If you're a person thinking about going into school teaching and you happen to be male, I would encourage you to consider going into um, the lower level elementary grades. We have, we have a dire need there. 97% of classroom teachers from the grades of preschool through uh, third grade are female, 97%. So most boys go to school and never see women, I mean never see men, as intellectual role models. They only see women in these roles. And that can be a significant detractor to them in terms of staying in school. So what can we do? Um, so we're, we're particularly in the Bring Back the Boys project, we are particularly interested in thinking about taking kids where they are. And so for us, we particularly said, where are boys now and what is it that they're doing that we could leverage and bring into the traditional curriculum to try to re-engage them in their education? So our focus has been on video games, and not just educational video games, in fact we're not very interested in educational video games, but rather what we call commercial off-the-shelf or POTS games. So these are games that are widely available that you probably have played. How many people here have played video games before? Great. Yell out some of the things that you've been playing. Men first. Men and boys first. What have you been playing? Huh? Call of Duty. Great. Huh? Halo, I heard Halo. FIFA. FIFA? FIFA what? Soccer? Yeah. Yep. Madden. Madden. What? Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto? 2K. What? NBA 2K Live. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. How about the girls? Are you playing games? Who's playing? Which girls are playing games? Raise your hands high. What are you playing? Diablo. Diablo? Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing. What else? Girls? What are you playing? Bloodborne. Say again? Love Lord, okay. Any others? Yep. Skyrim. Skyrim, good, okay, excellent, excellent. So what we see, there are some trends, right? There, are, there do tend to be trends between boys and girls and the kinds of games that they usually play. Some of those trends are breaking down in the last two or three years, but for the most part we still see that girls tend to play what we think of as more social games, um, Farmville and um, Candy Crush Saga and things that they've got on their phones. And boys and men tend to play more uh, video game controller uh, games, and they tend to play more violent video games in general, okay? So we've said, so why is the school so unfriendly to this? What is it about um, the traditional classroom that makes it such that boys aren't allowed to play, and girls for that matter, aren't allowed to do and play the things that they really enjoy? Um, as the photo narrative uh, says, 3.30 comes and the real education starts when they get to start to play games, because that's where they really are learning things. So I, I have um, a quick video here from um, Minecraft that I'm going to skip, because you have an expert in Minecraft right here on your campus, and if you're interested in Minecraft and how to use Minecraft with schools, you're much better off listening to Tony than anybody else I know. So you should go and talk to him if that's something that you're interested in. I'm going to skip that one. Um, but games, I think, are an important way, an important entree into how to get boys re-engaged in their education. So I'm going to describe a couple of different projects that we have going on right now. Um, Heather and Desha uh, have done some work with teacher views and understanding how teachers feel about games, what they think about games. I'm going to show you a little bit of video data from all of these studies, or from most of these studies. Um, Engerman, Jason Engerman, has been doing work focused on mapping off-the-shelf gaming outcomes onto the Common Core curriculum or onto traditional classroom outcomes. So if you say a person has played Assassin's Creed for X number of months and this person has really good skills and understands Italy really well, understands the Renaissance really well, um, you know, how, how can we leverage that inside of the classroom to say they've met certain outcomes in your classroom and so teacher, it's okay that they're playing these kinds of games, right? Um, the last one is Doug Wilson's work in higher education, which we're not going to spend a lot of time today talking about, but his work was specifically focused on um, Penn State's population. We have exactly 50-50 at Penn State. Penn State was late to the game in terms of bringing women into the university, and so as a result, we are still at 50-50, although we will very soon, I'm sure, move into the 55% range, but at the moment we're still about 50-50. Of that 50-50 range,
ratio between boys and girls on campus, interestingly, two-thirds of the people who are at risk of failing out are boys, are men on campus. So we've been trying to understand better what is it exactly that's contributing to men dropping out, men disengaging, men feeling alienated. And so this is all related to the same sort of gendered nature of schools. To concern me is because they write it. So this, this data was collected, I do what's called interpretive qualitative research. So um, a lot of my time is spent trying to create new knowledge. And my, the new knowledge that I'm doing, that I'm focused on right in the, in the next couple of slides here, are going to be about teachers and their acceptance of games and boys and their perceptions of games. So you can see sort of two sides of this cultural problem. Um, and this is as a result of some of my Petner's initial work, pilot study work, with teachers trying to better understand how they feel about games. So I'm going to share a little bit of what this second grade teacher has to say to us first. Uh-oh, maybe not. About playing video games, and I ask them, well, don't you do anything else? And they say, no, I can't think of anything else to write about until the point where I had to ban writing about video games just because I couldn't get anything else out of them. It was, which is okay, if that's their interest, that's fine, but sometimes I want something a little bit different. So I think that this, this teacher is really giving us an interesting perspective. She says, you know, writing was a problem because all I could get them to write about was video games. For this teacher, video games is one category. It's one monolithic thing. Her kids were probably writing about a lot of different things within video games. Lots of different kinds of quests, different kinds of games, lots of different reflections. But her perception was, it's video game, and they can't get them to write about anything else. And so I'm going to ban allowing them, I will no longer allow them to write about video gaming. And this is a really important perspective from the teacher's side. She needs them to be able to write and write well, but she wants to control the content of what they're writing about. In part, this is related to the zero tolerance policy. If they're writing about video games and it's, an, and it's a violent video game, then it gets flagged and sent to somebody for referral because we're concerned about the, whether the child has violent tendencies. Now, the reality of violent video games is that violent video games, there's, there's really not a, a clear linkage in the research, although the media sort of tries to say, well, video games cause kids to shoot schools up. Uh, the reality is that there's not a strong linkage that can be proven in any way by research that shows a relationship between violent behavior and violent video games or violent media of any sort, actually. Now, again, we, we feel like there's, but they've got to be desensitized to it. This has got to be bad for them. In reality, I think that we don't understand necessarily the nature of the violent fantasy play life that boys need to engage in order to grow up into manhood. And this is one of the things that we try to kind of quash or slow down or, or you know, eliminate in some way. So she's one of these people, I, I respect her as a teacher, she's a very good teacher, but she clearly is having a problem with video gaming in her classroom and she's limiting it. Um, in another portion, she, I believe she talks about Girls are obsessed with things too, but it's different. And it, I think part of the reason that it's different for her is because she can relate to the things that they're interested in because she's a woman. So she remembers being a young girl and being obsessed with braiding hair or something like that, right? I think it's an underlying current in our society that you know the multimedia games and things that um, are a distraction um, mentally, you know, um, and even when I get out to the laptops, um, there's the, the wanting us to go to a game site versus a uh, something else, and that's that's natural, I think. You know, um, and you know, other technology too is uh, the cell phones. They're in their pockets. They're they're doing that while instruction is occurring, of course. Um, I see evidence in their. So this teacher, this ninth, he's a ninth grade science teacher, um, clearly is struggling with the idea that learners, in order to be engaged, should be doing something that's really interesting to them. If, if what he was presenting them was as interesting as the games, then it's quite likely that the students wouldn't be interested in going to some other place that he doesn't want them to go to. But what he's asking them to do is not very interesting to them. And so the question then becomes, well, if kids feel alienated and kids feel disengaged, 
And part of that is because we're asking them to do stuff that they're not interested in. Why not let them do the things that they are interested in? And most people say, well, because you've got to make them do certain things. And there are lots of people, by the way, in the world who say, no, you don't. There are people in a movement called unschooling, and there are people in a movement called democratic schooling. And both of those basically say the child starts out with a natural curiosity. A four-year-old child is extremely curious, but by the time they're in third or fourth grade, they're no longer curious. They understand that they basically have to be force-fed something, and they have to do what is told to them, rather than exploring the things that they really, really are interested in. And so, as a result, I mean, this is a, a really difficult thing, but somehow, if we're going to re-engage these boys and bring them back in and try and reverse these trends of what we're seeing in boys failing out in the boy crisis, then we've got to really think seriously about how to engage them in something beyond the content that we've decided is good for them. Oh, sorry. Conversations, um, especially boys, are at eighth grade, which is 13, 14, 15 um, years old. They are very preoccupied with the activities they do outside of the classroom, which to a large extent is playing video games or maybe it's sports, either participating in a sport or watching sports on TV. Um, they're very preoccupied with that. Um, girls have things they're preoccupied with, but not typically video games, as far as I can tell. Um, just as far as I can tell why they're um, kind of conversational topics. Um, boys will talk on and on and on about the video games. Currently this year, 2010, Call of Duty is what they talk about, and they are talking from within the game and shouting across the room to each other, hey dude, I just entered the, I just saw the D-Day opening, which means, I don't know what, some sort of D-Day war scenario, they uh, achieved a game ranking that allowed them to enter into this new level of gameplay. So they'll, they'll talk about that, or um, the kinds of little levels or certification badges that they earn that show up on their status. Um, I think this is an online role-playing game, and the more you play, the more kind of badges you get, or something like this. Um, of course, then they also have skills, and then they play against other kids who are online. So um, they do things like honing noobs, which is um, beating up or killing the newbies, or you know, showing their fancy footwork. I guess I can only imagine that they're in a little action figure, and there's another little action figure that they're um, destroying in some way, or whatever they're doing to show their superiority. So. Honing news is a bit before. Okay, so I love this clip. I mean, this is pretty clearly um, the way that she's talking about this. If you think about it as a culture, if you think about video gaming as its own culture, um, in almost any other culture, this would be offensive language. Right? They're showing their fancy footwork, there are these little um, action figure things, and they're doing something with another little action figure thing. If this was the, something that you actually cared about, it would be pretty offensive to have somebody talking about it in this way. And I think sometimes we forget that this is its own culture, school is its own culture as well, and that right now they're not meeting. And part of it is that we have a tendency to say, to, to disparage the kinds of things that are happening inside of these games as in, in the worst possible terms. I think she's, she's pretty clearly doing that here. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because our time is quickly moving along. So what is the problem with gaming in classrooms? Within the classrooms, typically, um, the most common things we hear from teachers, uh, the next part of that video is actually, anybody ever seen Typing of the Dead? Yeah, okay. So we, we ask, we show the teachers Typing of the Dead, which is a game that is about zombies, and it's pretty graphic, but it's teaching you how to type. Um, so there's a clear, it's clearly a quote-unquote educational game. Um, but it's much more violent and gruesome than most educational games might, you know, might look. So um, we ask them what they think about that kind of a game, and they're like, oh, you know, the violence in it is just off, it's really awful. Why would I want to teach somebody to type that way? Um, the notion that that's motivating is not something that is necessarily enters into their dialogue when you listen to them talking about it. So the violence is number one. Um, and a lot of it is, well, you know, I had a kid once who played video games and that kid got in trouble with the law and they probably had, you know, have had 800 other students who also played video games, but they didn't get in trouble with the law, but the one that did is the one that they remember and they immediately make the link between this kid played a lot of video games and this kid also got in trouble. Um, so violence is number one. Competition is usually the second one. 
Um, so typically teachers, especially at the elementary level where we're losing a lot of boys, teachers do not want competition in their classroom. Most of our rhetoric for the last um, you know, two decades has been collaboration in classrooms, team building, getting people to work together and, and you know, communicate well. And the notion of competition is something that's really problematic in a lot of classrooms, even though kids thrive on it. Boys and girls love competition. Um, the last one is that it really focuses on individual achievement, and you can kind of hear a little bit of that in the language of the teacher that we just listened to. They get their individual badges or certificates, but this is very uncomfortable. Again, we would much rather think about things in teams and everybody wins, rather than having this notion of individual achievement being, being of, of great value, which is what happens in uh, these kinds of things. So there's a great book by Newkirk called Misreading Masculinity that if you have any doubts about how men and boys understand and experience violence and the violent nature of um, media and video games, this is a really good book to look at. This is a normal developmental stage. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, there's really mixed evidence in terms of research on the impact of violent video gaming and whether or not that actually leads to further real life violence. Uh, most of the time, I, I love to think about examples of my own boys. You know, they would be playing really rough housing, um, and, and they would, or they'd be playing a really violent video game or whatever. You know, they'd be doing all these things that we think of as you know pure like boy kind of things, and then all of a sudden they would notice a bunny at the side of the road who was hurting them. Oh my God, is the bunny okay? Oh, come help me with the bunny. And so you know, the notion that this somehow leads to I'm going to you know dissect the bunny is really not what I've observed and not what the media, not what the uh, uh, research tells us, but it is what the media would like to tell us, that that leads to, you know, other kinds of violent activities. So in general, I have not seen that, and I don't necessarily buy that, and the research doesn't support it. Um, we talked a little bit about competition, undermining the sort of collaborative classroom dynamic, and um, creating violent actions between kids, um, and uh, maintaining a certain amount of inequality, because kids who have these games at home may do better than kids who don't, uh, and that can really be problematic. It's interesting, my kids right now are playing a stock market game, and my boys have played a lot of video games. My daughter hasn't played a lot of video games. They're all in this class together, and they're all playing this game together. My, my daughter is like beside herself in tears every night. I'm losing this game, I'm so upset. It can't be that hard, she says to me. So and so's doing really well at it. So it can't be that hard, because I'm smarter than that person. So I don't understand why I'm not doing better in this game. And I say, well, because it's a game and you haven't really had any experience doing that a lot, you know? But the people who have played a lot of games are gonna do a little bit better in this. So it, it's, you know, this is, for people who don't have access to games, it can't create a certain inequality, or who choose not to. So, the next piece of this is what do boys say about games? And I think it's really important. I, I opened with that 13-year-old boy's quotes. Um, I think listening to what boys have to say about gaming is really critical. The first person that we're going to hear from, this young man down here is about a sixth grader, and he talks about failure in games and failure in schools. And I think that his is among the most compelling uh, quotes. Sometimes we're going to fail on the task, on the task at school, right? Yeah. And how do you feel about that when you feel at school? Um, I can't really explain that, but... Okay, so, she's asked him, how do you feel when you fail at school? And you kind of all know how he feels when he fails at school, he feels crappy. But he doesn't want to say that to her, because she's perceived as a teacher type person, maybe. He doesn't really know what her role is, so he's a little nervous about saying that to her. It's hard for me to explain how he is. It's like failing how you feel. Um, I feel fine. You might feel fine about that. This he says, I feel fine. He's trying to ask, is that the answer that you want? Do you want me to feel fine when I fail at that school? Pretty clearly, though, the, the real answer here that's underlying all of his all of his body language and everything that he's saying to us is he doesn't really feel great when he feels at school, and most of us don't. So that's a, a fairly predictable answer. Okay. Because the reason why I ask you is because you sometimes fail in a game, right? Yeah. And how do you feel when you fail in a game? Um, you'll be good if it's 
again on they put online. Uh, you lose, and but yet you come in first place. You have a good um, attitude, positive attitude. You won't have negative attitude. So even in fairness, you have positive, positive yes. attitude. And do you stay in these two environments? Um, do you think they're similar? They fell in games and fell in school. Um, they're not similar because in school you do not want to fail, but in a game it's all right to fail, just not in school. So do you, there you go. I mean, it's just a, it's a classic sort of statement. It's okay to fail in a game, but just not in school. So clearly the feeling that this child has is that when I play a game, I learn from my mistakes, I figure it out, I do it over again until I get it right. I, you know, there's a certain amount of grit, perseverance, as the other kid said, you know, that's being built by my playing this game over and over again until I get it right. Um, but in school, I get a one time, that's it. I get one shot and, and I don't get to go back and redo it over and over and over again until I get it right. So um, this is exactly what I think we would like our kids to say about school. Right? We would like to say, we would like to hear them say about school, it's okay if you fail in school because the next time you're going to figure it out, you're going to do better, and you know that's going to lead to you being able to master that material and be better at it over time. And it, it's okay if you fail, but that's not what we've communicated to them. It's the sort of overriding standardized examinations, all this testing constantly, then sending them reports that say you're above par, you're below par. That's really leading to this feeling of almost alienation in school. I have no control, I have no power, but when I gain, I do. And so we get a very different sort of answer from this child in terms of what uh, failure feels like in these two instances. Oh, when you play games like that, it does So this is a college student. Um, he had recently graduated from the high school where the project had begun. And um, we asked him to talk a little bit about gaming and what gaming has done for him in his real life every day, sort of, um, that we might be able to understand eventually in our minds, we're thinking, how can we map this onto what's happening in regular classrooms? Let's teach you how to deal with anger and frustration a little bit. You know, we're going to walk away from a problem and think about it, figure it out. Kind of teach you a little bit of problem solving skills, I think. I mean, I use that throughout life, not just, with, you know, games. You just got to walk away sometimes, think about it. Under for a minute, come back to it, try to figure it out again. Because when you play that game, you're playing in a team based game inside the game. You have to communicate, you have to be on the same page. And I think even in, in real life, you work in a team, in, in a job, in school, at a sports field, you got to be able to communicate effectively and clearly and to the point. And I think a lot of other games, you have to do that. You have to communicate clearly, effectively, and quickly. So interestingly, he's talking about emotional states and how he handles emotionally failure in games. Um, there was a really interesting study that was done just a couple years ago that looked at um, young men who had been in trouble with the law. So they were under 18, so they hadn't been sent to prison, but they had a first offense. And the question that, the correlation that they were doing, it didn't say this causes this, but the correlation that they were looking at is kids who played games, um, after their first offense, kids who had played games all along were more likely not to repeat offend a second time, which was a pretty interesting finding. In, in, it's in sort of direct contrast to our notion that if you're playing a lot of violent video games, you're going to go out and get yourself into more trouble. Instead, what we found was that these kids are figuring out how to handle their emotions. And they, some of them talk about, well, it's never good when you throw the game controller at the screen, because that's really, you know, when you get to that point, that's really bad, and you, you're going to do some damage, you're going to break some stuff, it's going to cost you money, so you've got to learn how to control that frustration and that anger that comes as a result of failure inside of games. I'm going to uh, keep moving along on this just because we're, we're going to quickly run out of time. So, game culture and school culture um, are not at all aligned. Rather, we have one kind of culture that's about school and one kind of culture that's about game. And in the middle of these two cultures, right in the nexus of these two cultures, are boys in particular who play a lot of games and are not succeeding in school. And the question is, is there a way for us to try to help the school culture move to a place where they can be at least more accepting of the notion of game culture? So, how do we use games? Well, we should not use educational games, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. 
Um, from my perspective, kids hate educational games. They don't like them. They don't want to play them. They're a little bit better than getting lectured at. But short of that, it's not, it's not really what they want to spend their time on. If given a choice in an after school club to play with an educational game or to play with something that they perceive as being commercial off the shelves that they're used to and that they really want to play, that's what they'll play. Nine times out of ten, those, those commercial off the shelf games have better musical scores, they have better graphics, they have better storylines, better narratives, more immersive, and more other people playing them that are more fun to play up against. So from my perspective, educational games are not our solution, but commercial off the shelf games might be. So we have to take them where they are and we have to change the culture of the school and also change somewhat the culture of the boy and the game. All of that needs to change so that we can find a meeting ground where we can bring back the boys, we can bring them back into their education, re-engage them in a way that they're really going to be excited about. Um, so that's what I have for you today and I can take questions now. You better make my house. Yes? How do I plan on doing what, exactly? So uh, what, I'm, what I'm interested in trying to think about now is furthering this, this strand of research so that as we come closer to understanding the, the distinctions between these cultures, then we can inform both cultures of the other. So for instance, this year at, um, many of you may have heard of the, the, the um, Consumer Electronics Show, the CES show, has anybody ever heard of that before? It's um, held in Las Vegas every year. And it's usually on CNN, they usually, you know, it's like a big deal. And this is where all the latest electronics for consumers get rolled out. The newest cars and stoves and everything else. So at that conference this year, we're going to be having a panel that involves uh, people who come from um, gaming research in, in higher education and people who come from the gaming industry. And so we're trying to start having some of those kinds of conversations where we cross those cultural boundaries. The first step in that really is, is to have conversations and help people see the differences and help teachers see the differences. So workshops and communication is really the first step in that. Once we have a pretty solid research foundation from which to work. Yes? Um, the one teacher said that she talked about in 2010 was most of this data from her. The data from the teachers was in 2010. The data from the boys span from 2011 to now. That data is uh, still being collected. We have a third uh, phase of it. It's a four-phase study. The third phase of that it is happening right now, and that's, some of that research is going to be reported at the ACT conference this uh, in about a month. I guess the last couple of weeks. Couple of weeks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, how receptive are the grade school teachers to you know uh, these types of studies coming from higher education uh, professors like that? You know, it's been interesting. Um, since I started this... Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, uh, how receptive are grade school classrooms and teachers and parents and administrators and everybody, really, to the message that we're talking about here in terms of games and, and kids, right? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's been interesting. Since I had the TED Talk, I had a TED Talk that came out, um, and that came out, I think, in 2010, maybe, or something like that. Um, and since then, I've had a lot of invitations to do keynotes like this. A lot of them have been to um, organizations that are full of teachers and or principals. So they've been really interested in the message. Um, and I think that they're just like, but how, how can we overcome all the objections about violent video games in our classrooms? We've just got so many parents and administrators, and when you talk to the administrators, they say the teachers don't want to do this. They're afraid of them. So there's a lot of fear and a lot of misunderstanding. One of the most common questions that I get is, isn't this debilitating our students in terms of social life? So they can, you know, then, and then I get, usually the description of this question is, I see kids walking all over campus on their cell phones and they're not interacting with each other at all. And I, my answer to them is they're interacting. They're very social in a very different way than maybe our generation understands. And so we have to understand social in a different way. Gamers are extremely social. And the notion of this gamer in his basement playing a game, you know, and, and uh, you know, pasty white and never going out and never doing anything else. Obviously, we don't want to encourage addictive gaming behavior or gaming behavior that, that sort of short circuits your, the proper development of your, of your life. But on the other hand, I see a lot of really good things coming out of these games. And when you start talking to teachers and you say, well, your kids are going to learn these things, you heard him talking about 
Learning team communications, for instance. If that's something that you think is important and that's a digital uh, media literacy skill that you want them to have in the 21st century, then maybe gaming is a really good way to try and reach that goal. Uh, and they're, when they really hear it that way, it's a little bit of a different take. So I'd say more open than I expected, to be honest. I thought I'd get complete shut down, but I've had lots of people from organizations that have wanted me to come in and help train their teachers to think about these things. Yes?
Yes, being a big. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how does that kind of influence your study at all? Um, you know, by and large, it really hasn't. Actually, Audrey Waters um, did a piece for a book that I'm putting together right now on dialogues, and it's specifically on um, women in the educational technology field, which is, is pretty interesting, actually. Um, and, but in terms of the study that we're doing with Bring Back the Boys, Gamergate hasn't really been a heavily influenced in, within that space. Um, I have not, I've not seen that kind of a response personally. I've not seen that kind of a response among my students, among my participants. I'm not sure that I would see. Um, I'm not sure that they show me that kind of a response. Um, it's a very serious problem. And I have a colleague at Penn State um, by the name of Gabriella Richard, who's doing some work specifically in um, the, the impacts of stereotypes inside of games, male, female stereotypes, um, uh, racial stereotypes, things of that sort within, the, within these various kinds of games, and what kind of an impact it may have beyond the game. Um, and it's fascinating work, but I think for the jury is still out on that question right now. Yes. So you mentioned that um, gaming is helping these, these young boys socialize. Do you think the, the type of game is determining their socialization? Because as you know, some of these games are extremely expensive. Yeah. And not everyone can afford them. So right. They make they purchase a cheaper version. Um, does that determine the type of socialization that's taking place? So I see these as two um, separate issues. The question you, was. Could you like summarize the question? Yes. So the question was, um, do I see there being a relationship between the kind of games that kids play and the socialization that they get? And a related question that she's asking is, some games are really expensive, so some people get less expensive similar kinds of games, or knockoff games, or free games, and is that impacting their socialization skills? That's not something that I have an answer to for sure, but I can tell you that I see them as two separate questions. So the socialization is absolutely uh, dependent on the kind of game that you're engaged in. So there are some games um, that are more like, um, like they, they are social in a certain kind of way. We think of them as social games that girls are more interested in. So Candy Crush Saga and Jeweled and all these Farmville and some of these kinds of things. Very low on violence, but really also um, very low on team building skills. They tend to be competitions between individuals, um, you know, words with friends, some of those kinds of things as opposed to um, like World of Warcraft, which is now a little bit more out of favor, Call of Duty is probably more what you guys would think of in this regard. And in that case, you're having to organize whole processes that you're doing together, um, you know, going on raids and things like that. And so the, the level of socialization, the level of communication is very high in those games, and it's a lot lower in some other games. This has actually led to some concern for girls and women. Women's groups are a little bit worried about the fact that men and boys are getting opportunities that women and girls are not getting uh, because they aren't playing the same kinds of games. So it is something that's of concern. Now the other piece of your question has to do with money and my answer to that is just that I think um, there are socioeconomic stratus differences and we have to, that's a problem that we have to figure out a way to practice. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I know you've got classes to go to.